Hi everyone, it's Kelly here. Thank you for stopping by. I'm so glad you could. Uh, we're getting closer to Christmas. I've got my Christmas earrings on. I'm going to talk to you today about some books that I've acquired. <laughs> oh dear. Um, it seems like every month so far since I've started this booktube channel, I have spoken about my out of control book buying habits, it seems. The first month I put it down to just coming out of lockdown and so it was still like, you know, I've ordered all these books online and then, you know, the shop started opening so I started going to my favourite book buying locations the, the next month. I, don't, I have no excuses. I've got no excuses here. I mean, I have gone to some shops that I haven't been to since before the pandemic. So that has probably been a factor, but I, I make no excuses. And you know what? I'm going to stop apologizing for it. I like buying books. It's a hobby that I have that is probably separate to my book reading hobby. And I'm just going to, it is what it is. It is what it is. I buy books deal with it okay let's talk about the books that I bought <laughs> in the month of November and also sort of into the beginning of December because you know what I'm going to stop making these monthly I'm just going to do them whenever I've got books that I want to talk about so let's have a look at some books that I've acquired recently because <laughs> we don't want this build up I'm like I'm going to count these at the end and we're going to we're going to talk about this and you know what I'm not even going to include my ebooks that I've bought this month we're just going to talk about physical books that I've brought into my home so <laughs> The first uh, shopping trip that these have come from, uh, I went to a store that I love and I've spoken about before called Berkelo Books. I particularly like, like the one that's in Leichhardt. Um, they have a secondhand section upstairs and the kind of new section downstairs. The secondhand section is Chef's Kiss, probably one of the best uh, secondhand book sections in also or shops in Sydney so I I 100% love this place it's the best and I always spend money there <laughs> no matter what so I've had people buy me vouchers for my birthday slash Christmas before for, for this shop great idea great idea because I will easily spend that money um <laughs> so I got some books, so I think all the ones that I'm going to talk about here are ones that are from the upstairs secondhand section. Um, so I've gotten these for like a good deal in my opinion, and I also really like the selection at this shop because they t they have stuff that you would just I wouldn't know about or that I wouldn't you know I've just it, that serendipity um, of just finding something that's like an interesting gem, and I think this first book is a, a good example of that. So uh, this book is called. The Plant Kingdoms of Charles Jones, um, and it is a nonfiction book about this guy called Charles Jones, who was an English gardener, and he took hundreds of photographs of the things that he was growing in his garden. And these photos are just like they're gorgeous studio portraits of vegetables. Um, I'm going to find you some of the like, look at that. Look at that. Um, so they're these beautiful, like, black and white images of just vegetables. And they're just beautiful. So, yeah, I just, this was in the photography section. And I could not be happier with this purchase. I make no apologies. This I'm really excited about this book. Um, so I'm really interested to, like, look at, uh, at this collection and, and to sort of, you know, study it in a bit more depth and, and to learn more about this guy who was just a, dude with a garden who liked to grow vegetables and did it in a really beautiful way and then took lots of photos of what he was growing which in my opinion is amazing <laughs> um another book that I got on that same shopping trip is called Razorhurst and um this is by Justine La hmm, La Balestier La Balestier possibly <laughs> um now this uh, this book is set in Sydney. So um, for those of you who don't know, and if you're not 
from Sydney, you probably don't. Um, back in the like twenties, there we had a really bad um, gang problem in the inner city, in a suburb called Surrey Hills, which is where I used to work. Um, I don't work there anymore, but uh, I walked part in in these in around this suburb as I was like walking to and from my work from the train station, and. Um, started to kind of like learn more about the history of of this and they called them um, the razor gangs because they literally used razors as weapons um to like hurt people uh, but they also uh, in in this same kind of era there were these female kind of um gang bosses and like you know uh, who were they who were dealing in things like drugs and um uh, prostitution and also in uh, sly grog, so um, liquor, the illegal liquor, because at, the, at that time the, the the rules in that area were that after a certain time um, you couldn't sell alcohol anymore. Uh, so there was this kind of like on the sly trade going on and, you know, these some of these people made a lot of money um, trading in, in those things that people wanted uh, um, and couldn't otherwise get. So this is a fiction story. So uh, actually this is in 1932. It's not in the 20s at all, but it's coming out of that era. Um, so this is um, uh, two competing uh, mob bosses called Gloriana Nelson and Mr Davidson. Um, and then we've got some people uh, who are sort of like underlings in this world and it's a, a sort of a story about uh, these two people and they're into, from two different gangs who um, interact. So I'm, it's probably, it may be a bit trashy, I don't know, it might be really good, um, but I just am really interested in that period of my city's history and I thought I would pick up a book um, that sounded really interesting set in that time. So Razorhurst by Justine La Ballastia. Uh, then the another book that I got at that time is an E.M. Forster book um, called A Passage to India and I purchased this one because it's just a lovely edition. It's a hardback um, and it's just, you know, really lovely, a lovely edition. It has really nice end papers and all the rest uh, from the Great Writers Library. And it actually turned out that my husband has another book from this same Great Writers Library um, another another classic book. So that was just an interesting aside. He was like, oh, that looks really familiar and went and pulled the book out of his and, you know, they clearly are from the same set. So very interesting. Um, but, yeah, I read um, Morris by Ian e. Forster earlier this year and really, really loved it. So I am now keen to read some other books from his back catalogue and pa A Passage to India is one of them. So that's why I picked that one up. Um, and finally, from that same trip, I picked up a play, um, which is called by uh, by Tom Stoppard called Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead. It's just a short little play. And I thought um, plays are not something I read much anymore. I remember reading them at school and university when I was doing my English subjects, but I haven't really picked up a play since then. So I thought I'd give um, this one a, a go because why not? <laughs> um, so that's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead. Then I picked up a book um, from another bookstore that I went into that I like to go to that's sort of nearby to my house um, and it's called Notre Dame by Ken Follett. Uh, Ken Follett wrote The Pillars of the Earth which I read some years ago now probably like maybe getting towards 10 years ago but I found that book so compelling and the reason that I found that book so compelling was the way that Ken Follett described the architecture so if you've never read the book before it has I don't know if it's every chapter but most chapters begin with um descriptions of a cathedral that's being built and it's just a really um I just found the way that he spoke about that and wrote about uh, that architecture so compelling and interesting and engaging. Um, so when I saw that he'd written this nonfiction book about Notre Dame, I was and it was a really good price too. It's also um, he's donating a hundred percent of the royalties to the charity La Fondation La Fondation du Patrimoine. What I cannot speak French. I don't know why I tried to do that. 
a charity, <laughs> um, which I'm assuming is the charity to do with getting Notre Dame fixed up. So, um, yeah, I just thought this was an interesting, like, short little non-fiction book about Notre Dame Cathedral in uh, Paris. It's in Paris, right? I think it's in Paris. Yeah, it's in Paris. <laughs> Trust yourself, Kelly, you know where this is. <laughs> um, so Notre Dame Cathedral, uh, so it's called A Short History of the Meaning of Cathedrals, um, specifically about Notre Dame by Ken Follett. Okay, then I'm going to show you some of the books that I have purchased online. So <clears throat> some of these I just bought um, and others I got in the, in the sales. So in the, um, what do they call it, Black Black Friday sales? excuse me, <clears throat> in the, the Black Friday sales. So um, the first one is uh, called Love Stories by Trent Dalton. Um, I have spoken a little bit about Trent Dalton before. He's an Australian author who's written two well-loved books. One's called Boy Swallows Universe. And the other one, the name of which escapes me, but I'll put it up on the, on the screen somewhere, um, uh, which I own and have not yet read. But this is his latest one. Um, and this one is a really interesting concept, which I'd sort of heard about and I've been kind of just following him on Instagram and, you know, talking about his book and all of that sort of thing. And in the end, I just decided to buy it because it just, um, just the concept of this book seemed so compelling. So essentially what he did, he, I believe lives in Melbourne in Australia. He set up a typewriter, um, in a busy place on a little table and had a sign up saying something along the lines of tell me your love stories um and so people would stop and would tell him story love stories and they're not just romantic love stories they're also you know um family love stories and and all of those kind of things as well so it's it's a really diverse i believe collection of short stories so then he's turned those stories that people told him on the street into this uh, collection of stories and it's a hardcover beautiful beautiful edition um and yeah it's just a a set of stories of love um so maybe i think i might wait to maybe february and read this around um valentine's day maybe we'll see We'll see. Um, but yeah, I'm really interested to get to this, but I think I'm also going to be taking away on my holidays in January um, at least one other Trent Dalton book because I really would like to get to those um, that have been sitting on my shelf for a little while now. <laughs> um, so that's Love Stories by Trent Dalton. And then, uh, so that one I just bought off, just I just bought it. Um, and then I purchased a few books in the sales for um, for Black Friday online. Um, so one of them is The Shelley Bay Ladies Swimming Circle by Sophie Green. Um, again, I believe this is an Australian author. It's set in Australia anyway in 1982. Um, and it's a seaside suburb. And it's basically this um, story of these women who take up swimming um, in, I believe, uh, a sea pool or perhaps it's just a local pool but I think it's a sea pool um so yeah I'm really interested to read this one um I think this also might be a nice one to take away on holidays I'm that the pile of books that I'm planning to take away on holidays is getting bigger and bigger and bigger um but yeah this is one I think that will go down a treat uh while I'm on the coast listening to the ocean um and thinking about swimming and actually swimming probably don't take the book in the ocean Maybe on the beach, though. <laughs> See how we go. Um, so, yeah, I'm very uh, interested in this, like, little group of women and, and um, the kind of things that they talk about and, and ha help each other with. Uh, so that's what I believe this one's about, but I'll have to let you know once I actually read it. Um, another one that I've bought in the sales was Gulliver's Wife, and it's by an author called Lauren Chater, or Chater, and... I read uh, this book, The Lace Weaver, a few years ago now and really enjoyed it. Um, so when I saw that this one was on sale and I, so basically I bought this on uh, from the, the author's name and also because it's uh, like a really stunning cover too, I have to say. Um, so this is set in 1702 in London. Um, a, a woman called Mary Burton Gulliver, her husband is lost at sea 
Um, and she is a midwife and herbalist, and she's re forced to rebuild her life without him. Um, and but then he comes home, and it's it's Gulliver, as in the the Gulliver from Gulliver's Travels. Um, he comes comes home, uh, fevered three years later, fevered and communicating only in riddles. Her ordered world is turned upside down. In a climate of desperate poverty and violence, Mary is caught in a crossfire of suspicion and fear, driven by her husband's outlandish claims, and it is up to her to navigate a passage to safety for herself and her daughter and the vulnerable women in her care. When a fellow sailor, a dangerous man with nothing to lose, appears to hold sway over her husband, Mary's world descends deeper into chaos and she must set out on her own journey to discover the truth of Gulliver's travels and the landscape of her own heart. So that should be in, an interesting one. Also, um, I believe this author is also an Australian author, so that's uh, very exciting because I'm hoping to read more Australian books in the new year. Uh, then I've picked up Malibu Rising by Taylor Jenkins Reid. Uh, everyone has been talking about this book. It came out this year. It was at a good price. So I thought, yep, I'll grab it. Um, and it is something I would be interested in reading. So it's set in 1983. Oh, so that's actually at the in the same era as um, the other book I was just talking about. Uh, so it is Malibu, August 1983. It's the day of Nina Reavers annual end of summer party and anticipation is at fever pitch everyone who's anyone wants an invite to catch a glimpse of the famous reaver siblings nina the talented surfer and supermodel brothers jay and hyde one a championship surfer the other a renowned photographer and their adored baby sister kit together the siblings are a source of fascination in malibu and the world over especially as the children of the legendary singer mick reaver by midnight the party will be completely out of control by morning, the Reaver Mansion will have gone up in flames. But ahead of that first spark in the early hours before dawn, the alcohol will flow, the music will play, and the loves and secret secrets that shape this family will all come bubbling to the surface. So it sounds really interesting. <laughs> um, so I am quite keen to get to that one too at some point soon. Um, more recently, so again in the in the sales, I picked up this one. Um, a Carter Witch by Nettie Okorafor, who is, I believe, a Nigerian author. Yeah, she, oh, sorry. She lives in Nigeria, but she was born in New York City. Um, oh, and she, her features, it says on the back here, her features are West African, but she's al albino, albino. Um, Okay, sorry, this is not the author. This is the character in the book. Sorry, my bad. I'm reading the back like that's a, a description of the author. I'm like, that's very um a chatty way <laughs> for them to talk about the, the author. Um, so, okay, the character is uh, lives in Nigeria but was born in New York and she is albino but with West African features. Um, she's a terrific athlete but can't go out into the sun to play soccer. There seems to be no place where she fits in and then she discovers something amazing. She is a free agent which they've got in inverted commas, with latent magical power. And she has a lot of catching up to do. Soon she's part of a quartet of magic students studying the visible and invisible, learning to change reality. But she, just as she's finding her footing, Sunny and her friends are asked by the magical authorities to help track down a career criminal who knows magic too. Will their training be enough to help them against a threat whose powers greatly outnumber theirs? Um, so... There is also a sequel, which I did not know, called A Carter Warrior. So if I enjoy this, I might pick that one up as well. Um, so that should be really, really interesting. Um, then the last one from this section <laughs> of me purchasing things um, online is called uh, Hildegard von Bing, Hildegard of Bingen, A Poetic Journey by Colleen Keating. And you can see the gorgeous um, cover they have there. So Hild Hildegard von Bingen was a sort of mystic nun, I think, um, who lived a long time ago. Uh, and this is telling the story of her in a, in poetry. Um, so that should be an interesting one. So again, this was just a, um, a, a random thing that I discovered while I was kind of flicking through the sales and I'm interested in Hildegard von Bingen and saw this and thought, yeah, sure, I'll give it a go. So that's all that one is. All right, then we get on to a very big shopping trip to, that I did. So I um, 
not too far away from where I work, there is a secondhand bookstore. Um, it's a Lifeline bookstore, if anyone in, in Australia knows that charity. So the, the money from the sales go towards supporting um, the Lifeline helpline and, and other aspects of that charity. So it's a really, and also they just do books. So it's a really, really good um, bookstore um, in terms of secondhand books. So I picked up like quite a few, <laughs> quite a few books. So I'm just going to show those to you as well. Um, so the first one is a book called The Loudness of Unsaid Things by Hilda Hinton or Hildy, I think it might actually be. So Hilda Hinton is the sister of um, an actor in Australia called Sam, what is his name? I'm not going to be able to think of his name now. His name's Sam, but I can't remember his last name. Anyway, a, a well-known actor in Australia, um, and this is his sister who's written this book. Um, uh, and it is about, uh, so it's an unforgettable story of loneliness, isolation, and finding your way. I believe it was only published this year, or perhaps last year it may have been published. 2020. So it's a relatively recent book. Um, and it says, this is on the back, uh, an unforgettable story of loneliness, isolation and finding your way. Miss K works at the, the Institute, a place for the damaged, the outliers, the not quite rights. Everyone has their different strategies to deal with the residents. Some bark orders, some negotiate. Miss K found that simply being herself was mostly the right thing to do. Uh, and then we've got another character called Susie, who was seven when she realised she had had her fill of character building. She'd lie between her holly hobby sheets, thinking how slowly birthdays came around, but how quickly change happened. One minute her dad was saying that the family needed to move back to the city and then Shazam, there they were. Um, her mum didn't move to the new house with them and Susie hated going to see her in the, at the mind hospital. She never knew who her mum would be or who would be there. As the years passed, there were so many things Susie wanted to say but never could. Miss Kay will teach Susie that the loudness of unsaid things can be music and together they will learn that living can be more than surviving. So that sounds like a bit of a heart wrencher, <laughs> um, but I am interested in um, getting to that one because I've heard a lot about this book and it's uh, been very well received. So very keen to get to it. Another book I've picked up is called Minor Detail by Adania Shib Shibley. Um, and it's a translated book, translated by Elizabeth Jacquet. Um, and this, uh, uh, I've heard about this book um, I'm going to say it was on the channel. I think it was on Emmy, the channel Emmy. Um, so Emma on that channel was talking about this book. I think if so, I will link it below. <laughs> um, uh, so basically what this book is about, there's a, a brutal crime that's committed one year after the war of 1948, which Palestinians mourn as the, the Nakba, the catastrophe that led to the displacement, exile and refugeedom of more than 700,000 people and which Israelis celebrate as the War of Independence. Many years later, in the near present day, a woman in Ramallah reads about this minor detail in a larger context and becomes fascinated by it to the point of obsession. In this compelling novel, Shibley's haunting prose in, is a form of resistance in itself. So basically, you've got, um, it's a so content warning for this book. It's a, a rape and murder um, of a young woman. And so it's kind of just revolves around the kind of unfolding of this, um, not of the event itself, but the information about the event. So the discovery of this, of this detail and kind of the impact that it has had, that it had at the time, but also continues to have into the present day. So that's, um, I believe, a quite a hard hitting book, but also one um, that I'm sure it was Emmy. I'm sure that's the channel where I heard the review of this that was so good. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, I will maybe not get to this in the summer. Uh, it might be one to read when I'm in a more reflective, cooler weather mood. So perhaps a bit later in the year. Um, but I'd love to get to this one because it sounds so interesting. Um, on a completely different note, um, I also picked this one up called A Very Country Christmas. Now, I believe this is the same book I've picked up on, um, uh, I bought this on Kindle uh, last month, maybe, in the Kindle sales. I found a copy of it um, 
at the store so I picked it up as well um, just because I thought I might like to dip into it we'll see how we do they're just some short stories um, that are set in Australia at Christmas time so if I get to it which I don't know if I will this year but what if I don't I'll hold on to it till next year um, and we'll uh, read it then so there are one two three four five short stories um, in this book so perhaps I will get to maybe one of them um, this year or perhaps not <laughs> um, so that should be interesting um, another book that I have picked up is this one called Miss Austin um, by Gil or Jill Hornby um, and it's based on a literary mystery that has long puzzled Jane Austen fans 1840 23 years after the death of her famous sister Jane uh, Cassandra Austen returns to the village of Kintbury. She knows that in some dusty corner of the sprawling vicar vicarage there is a cachet of family letters um, containing secrets that must not be revealed. As Cassandra recalls her youth and her relationship with her brilliant yet complex sister, she pieces together the together buried truths about Jane's history and her own. And she faces a stark choice. Should she... Oh, there's a sticker. <laughs> Over a word... I think it's going to say lie. No, it's not. It's act. Should she act to protect Jane's reputation or leave the contents of the letters to go unguarded into posterity? Get that sticker off completely. That does sound really fascinating. Um, so I would really like to get to this while I'm reading my Jane Austen books because at the moment I'm working my way through them. So perhaps I might read this in February after I finish the last of the Jane Austen novels. That would be quite good. This pile is getting pretty tall. <laughs> um, another book I picked up was is uh, Mammoth by Chris Flynn. Um, so <laughs> this is quite interesting. So it's narrated by a 13,000 year old extinct mammoth. Um, and this is the mostly true story of how a collection of prehistoric creatures came to be on a sa on sale at a natural history auction in New York in 2007. By tracing how and when these fossils were unearthed, Mammoth leads us on a funny and fascinating journey from the uh, ple uh, Pleistocene, Pleistocene epoch to 19th century America and beyond, revealing how ideas about science and religion have shaped our world. With our planet on the brink of calamitous climate change, Mammoth scrutinises humanity's role in the destruction of the natural world while also offering a message of hope. So that sounds quite interesting, a bit, a bit of a non-fiction but written in an interesting way. Uh, then we got this book, which is called Now That I See You by Emma Batchelor. Um, so this is um, an LGBTQI plus book um, I believe and it is also a psychological masterclass in exploring why and how we become who we are and what that means for for the people closest to us um, so it's by uh, that is a quote from Stephen Rome in the Australian uh, so let me read the back to you in those first moments that admission felt precious to me it was something that I alone had been had deemed worthy enough to carry and I was grateful I was grateful to finally know but I still couldn't speak Something was wrong, she knew it, but she was entirely unprepared for what he would tell her. Viewed through the lens of a relationship breakdown after one partner discloses to the other that they are transgender. This auto this auto fiction spans 18 months from the moments of first discovery through the eventual disintegration of their partnership to the new beginnings of independence. In Diaries and Letters, Now That I See You unfolds a love story that, while often messy and uncomfortable, is a poignant and personal exploration of identity, gender, love, and grief. Um, so when I read the back of the, I hadn't heard of this book when I picked it up, um, but when I picked it, I read the, the back of the book. I was really interested in that story. That sounds like something I have not read before. So I'm really keen to get to that one. Um, I also picked up a copy of Hamnet um, by Maggie O'Farrell, um, which was the winner of the Women's Prize for Fiction uh two years ago maybe let's see when it was published it's either gonna be yeah 2020 so it must be uh because it wasn't this year so it must be 2020 um so i've heard a lot about this and a lot of people who i've seen review it online have really loved it um so i thought i'd pick it up because i saw it there and it was a good price 
which I have rubbed out. But I feel like it was about nine dollars or so. So and for like a in re very good condition um, paperback in the the style that I like to read them, I was quite happy to pay that price. I spent a lot of money on that shopping trip, I have to say. <laughs> um, so this is all about uh, Hamlet's unnamed son. Um, so he never mentions um, Hamnet, uh, but it's that's who this book is about. Um, so this is. Um, so I'll read the back to you. On a summer's day in 1596, a young girl in Stratford-upon-Avon takes to her bed, her bed with a fever. Her twin brother, Hamnet, searches everywhere for help. Why is nobody at home? Their mother, Agnes, is over a mile away in the garden where she grows medicinal herbs. Their father is working in London. So I believe that Shakespeare is never actually mentioned in this book, but you just know that it is. Um, neither parent knows that one of the children will not survive the week. Hamnet is a novel inspired by the son of a, a famous playwright. It is a story of the bond between twins and of a marriage pushed to the brink by grief. It is also the story of a kestrel and its mistress, a flea that boards a ship in Alexandria, and a glove maker's son who flouts convention in pursuit of the woman he loves. Above all, it is the tender reimagining of a boy whose life has been all but forgotten, but whose name was given to one of the most celebrated plays ever written. Uh, so that is Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. I also, uh, this is the last book from that shopping trip, um, picked up a copy of Honey Bee by Craig Selby. I listened to this as an audio book earlier this year, and this is one of my top books of the year. I loved it so much. And I, despite knocking back a free copy of this book that I was offered um, because I had already read it, I've subsequently been thinking about it some more and I decided I would like a physical copy of it. So when I found this one, I picked it up and purchased it. It's in really, really good condition. So um, I'm very, very excited to own this, even though I've already read it, um, because I know it's one that I will reread because I loved it just so much. Uh, now, the last book that I acquired, I acquired today uh, on the day of filming this early in December. So um, that is a copy of Station Eleven um, by Emily St. John Mandel. So this is one that I've heard a lot about um, and is, a, you know, a, fa a favourite of many people. Um, and I picked this up in a little free library, um, which are those, you know, the little boxes that people have. Uh, so this one was outside, I think it was like a... Um, a school, uh, maybe not a school, uh, like a play group, play, what do they call those? An early childhood kind of centre. Um, so they had one there and uh, my husband and I were just passing by today and thought we'd just pop in and have a look and he ended up getting some books and I ended up getting this. So um, we have Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel and let me read the back to you. Uh, it says, what was lost in the collapse? Almost everything, almost every one, but there is still such beauty. One snowy night in Toronto, famous actor Arthur Leander dies on stage whilst performing the role of a lifetime. That same evening, a deadly virus touches down in North America. The world will never be the same again. 20 years later, Kirsten, an actress in the Travelling Symphony, performs Shakespeare in the settlements that have grown up since the collapse. But then her newly hopeful world is threatened. If civilization was lost, what would you preserve? And how far would you go to protect it? So this sounds like a very interesting book. Um, and I've heard lots and lots of people talking about this one. So um, I am very interested to read it. It's got some uh, very uh, high profile authors who have... Uh, commented on it. Jesse Burton, who wrote a book I read a few years ago called The Miniaturist, um, described it as disturbing, inventive and exciting. And George R. R. Martin, who we all know and love, wrote, wrote that it is a beautifully written and wonderfully ele um, elegiac, elegiac. I've never seen that word before. I have no idea what it means, but I'm assuming it's a good thing. <laughs> um, a book that I will long remember, he says. So that's a, that's quite the recommendation, even though I don't understand it. Um, and I am keen to get to it at some point, um, hopefully in the new year. So this is my gigantic stack of books I have acquired, uh, mostly in November, but a little bit into December as well. Um, so I've got lots and lots of reading to do. I need to stop shopping. I have gone completely overboard and 
I have no excuses for it, but I'm going to own it. I'm okay with it. We love books in this house. We are happy to have books coming into this house uh, whenever books come into this house. So I am not going to stop shopping. There'll be more shopping in January. Don't you worry about it when I go on holidays and visit some bookshops that I uh, have not been to for some time. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Hopefully you've heard about some books here that you perhaps haven't heard about before. And I will let you know once I get to them how they go. <laughs> See you on the next one. Bye.